we are all natural born storytellers, whether you think of yourself that way or not. The stories that mold and shape our lives oftentimes become foundational parts of our growth, healing, and even generational experiences. Welcome to Awaken Your Soul Sunday, a storytelling series that share the moments of awakening, trials and tribulations, truth, and vulnerability in the words and voice of the featured storyteller. And now, a life-changing story from this week's guest. On the morning of October the 11th, 1996, I woke up not knowing what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. But by noon that day, it was absolutely crystal clear. My name is Mac Monroe, and I'm the founder and CEO of Boss Builders. And while that seems like a very short story, it's actually a pretty long one. And it's a story for anybody who doesn't quite know what they want to do with their life, and they feel like they're in a big hurry to figure it out. The story ended on October the 11th, 1996, and that started a whole new career for me. But it was leading up to that that was really, I think, the significant story. So we have to back up just a little bit earlier than that, and that would be the spring of 1982. And so in the spring of 1982, I was a senior at a very prestigious college prep high school in Southern California. And in this group of very talented seniors, many of whom were already accepted to schools like Stanford and USC, I had the privilege of being ranked fourth in my graduating class which isn't all that significant because that was fourth from the bottom. And so I really didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I just knew that I wanted to get out of school and never, ever return. And so graduation came in June. I actually walked across the stage with an empty little folder that didn't have my diploma in it because I had to go to summer school and finish up one last credit. But I actually decided to go to a trade school. And so I went to a trade school. It was the Southern California College of Medical and Dental Careers. And I was studying to become a dental laboratory technician. So if you're not familiar with that, a lab tech is the person that does dental appliances. They make crowns and bridges and dentures. And while I wasn't that great academically, I really enjoyed working with my hands. And so I went to the school. I did very well in it. And at the, about the fifth month of that six-month program, we started putting out applications for employment. And it was really, really tough. There was a recession going on at the time. Every lab that I applied to wanted at least six years of experience. And I had, you know, five whole months of it. And so after, you know, getting told no a number of times, I went back to my instructors and I asked them what they suggested. Well, they were both retired Navy dental technicians, and they told me, they says, you know, we learned how to be lab techs in the Navy. Why don't you check the Navy out? Because even though you'd have to go back through lab school a second time, you'd get at least five years of experience. You'd be pretty decent pay. You could travel. Well, that sounded good to me, so I went to talk to a Navy recruiter, and the recruiter told me, he said, oh, my goodness, with that certificate, yeah, the Navy really needs you. And he says, so here's how it works. You have to go to basic training, and then you'll have to go to dental assisting school. He said, but don't worry about that, because halfway through that 12-week program, anybody that is interested in lab school takes a special test where you carve a little piece of chalk into a tooth. And if you pass that, why, then they'll take you on to lab school guaranteed. So just a little FYI here, if a recruiter ever guarantees something, you better run the other way because they can't really guarantee much of anything. Of course, I didn't know any better. So I went ahead and signed all the papers and did the physical and then uh, swore in and went to boot camp in December of 1983. Well, boot camp was pretty easy. Uh, All we really did is march around fold clothes. It wasn't nearly as rigorous as I had hoped. And so we went on to dental assisting school. And I can remember in that very first week of dental assisting school thinking, God, this job friggin' sucks. Because literally, that's what you do as a dental assistant. You suck blood and spit through a suction tube, and then you hand instruments to the dentist. Well, I knew I was going to lab school, so I thought, okay, we'll just get through this. Well, we did the chalk carving halfway through as promised, and of course, I aced it. And then the head of the lab school said, well, unfortunately, we have no openings in lab school this year, so you're going to have to go to the fleet and reapply in three years. And I says, well, yeah, but what am I going to do for three years? He said, well, you're a dental assistant. And I said, yeah, but... I didn't join the Navy to become a dental assistant. And he said, well, no one really cares what you want. The needs of the Navy are always most important. So immediately this whole dream was shattered. And I mean, it didn't take but two minutes of that conversation. And so 
at that point now I'm stuck. I have a six-year enlistment, and I don't want to do what I'm told to do. Uh, the only consolation prize was my first set of orders, which were to Navcom stay Harold E. Holt in Exmouth, Western Australia. So just like me, just like you, I guess, all I really understood was Australia. I didn't bother looking at a map, and it turns out it was a very isolated duty station. And so 26 hours of flying later, we landed on this remote outpost in the middle of nowhere, and it was a very isolated base. It was in its highest use during the Cold War, and that's where we would track Soviet submarines in the Indian Ocean. So this was a small dental clinic, one dentist, and three technicians, and so I get met at the airport by my sponsor, and he says, well, let's go to the clinic and you can meet your new boss. So I meet my new boss. He's this tall, physically fit Navy lieutenant commander. His name was Dr. Gary Backer. And the first thing Dr. Backer says to me is, Monroe, you're fat. You need to go to the gym and get your fat measured because I know you're going to be on the fat boy program. And that just continued to escalate poorly. You know, we'd work together and if I hand him the wrong instrument, he'd kick me in the shins really hard and you know, it was miserable. Already my dreams were crushed. I didn't want to be in the Navy. I really didn't ever really want to be in. I just wanted the training. And now I'm stuck. Well, mercifully, Dr. Backer left, and his replacement was very different. His name was Greg Nelson, and he really took an interest in me, and he, he got me to think more of myself. He pushed me to go to school. He really thought that I should go to dental school. He made me sign up for college classes, and he encouraged me. I mean, even to the point where he allowed me to fix one of his broken fillings. And so if you have a boss like that, you know, that's pretty special. And when I left that duty station, I had a whole new set of, I guess, enthusiasm. I was uh, newly married, had a young daughter. She was about maybe seven months old. And so I didn't want to stay in the Navy, but <clears throat> I actually had to re-enlist to get orders back closer to home. Because if I was going to get out, I needed to be close to where I could find a job. So I thought, well, let's go ahead and re-enlist. So Went to Naval Hospital Long Beach, which was very close to where I grew up, so we had family everywhere, and started to attend school at night. But that took its toll on my marriage, and so went through a really ugly divorce, remarried, and then, you know, it came up for orders again. And I thought, well, shoot, do I re-enlist? Do I just walk out of the Navy? I didn't like the Navy, and I think the thing I didn't like the most was working for really bad bosses. And as I got a little more senior, it got a little easier, but it still wasn't what I wanted to do. And lab school was definitely something I was no longer interested in. And now I'm getting a little older. I have two children and married again for the second time. And so we took a set of orders to the Pacific Island of Guam. And I was over there for two years. And I really, at that point, thought, you know, let's start working toward this officer candidate program. And to do that, you had to get a bachelor's degree. And so ended up getting a bachelor's in healthcare management, trying to get this promotion. And I applied and did not get it. And the recruiter that was scanning applications told me, he says, everybody who got picked up, and there was, I think, 13 people out of maybe, maybe 700 applicants. He said, all of them had a master's degree. And so I'm thinking, good Lord, it's kind of like you're finishing a race and someone tells you, oh, we forgot to tell you the finish line is another mile down the road. So I went to sign up for a master's program, and my criteria was really pretty simple. I just needed to find a master's that didn't have math in it, because I'm terrible at math. And so I stumbled upon organizational leadership with Chapman University. And so I went to the program. It was not really all that interesting to me. I would have just paid for the stupid master's, but instead I'm having to learn about management theory and things like that. Well, that was actually during the time I was in my first role as a manager, and I had a terrible boss. His name was Captain Davies, and I was the leading petty officer at the Branch Dental Clinic in Silverdale, Washington, working for this guy who was really, he wasn't a screamer. He just talked to you like you were stupid, and that just drove me absolutely crazy, and he would come to me with every little mundane request. Petty Officer Monroe, there's no toilet paper in the bathroom. Petty Officer Monroe, how come there's technicians goofing off over here and I thought man it's just like I'm babysitting and this guy is driving me crazy and I really just could not figure out what I wanted to do the Navy just was not it for me Captain Davies was in my nightmares every night I just was not happy and that led to that morning on October the 11th 1996 Captain Davies called me in for the morning meeting we had a daily meeting and he would give me his list of to-do's 
And then he started in on me on why the plan of the week had not been changed in the officer's lounge. Now, the plan of the week is a little document that command would send out every Monday, and it would tell you the events of the week. And so he says, come, let's go look at it. So I had to walk like a little child behind him back to the officer's lounge. And there's some officers sitting in there working. And so he goes to the plans of the week, which were on this clipboard. They were all stacked up. And he's going through them. He says, look at this. This is over two weeks old. Don't they teach you how to read calendars in that master's program you're at? And that's when I snapped. And his back was to me, so he never saw this. And I'm not sure the other officers were paying any attention to it. But I reached out, about ready to put my fist through the back of his head. And the only reason I didn't kill him that morning is that my son, Dustin, was only about three or four months old. And I thought, man, if I kill my boss, you know, what am I going to do? I won't be able to see my kid anymore. He'll wind up in the system. I mean, I had this whole narrative. But I think the beauty of that moment was the clarity. And I was about 33 years old at the time. So all of these years, not knowing clearly what I wanted to do with my life, and basically miserable at every job I did after high school, suddenly the clarity was there. And there was a new mission in my life, and that was to rid the earth of bad managers and create the next generation of great managers. And the beauty of that moment is that I felt a sense of freedom. I knew that I didn't have to stay in the Navy anymore. I knew that Captain Davies was no longer the focal point of my life. He was simply someone who inspired me to do something far better than I could ever imagine. And I went ahead and walked out of the Navy at the 15-year mark, which a lot of people said that was crazy. But for me, it didn't matter because after all that time, I finally figured it out. And if there's any message I can share with you that you can take from that story is that Don't feel pressured and rushed to figure out what you want to do with your life. You may be listening to this and be in high school. You may be in your 20s or 30s, or you may be in your mid to late 50s like me, and yet there's always time for you to figure it out. I think the key is to just keep an open mind, view everything in life as an experience that leads up to something powerful. And in the case of me, it's led to a business that I thoroughly enjoy and look forward to doing this kind of work. And I look back at all of the things in the past, and even though some of them were very painful, they were all necessary to get to where I am today. That's my hope for each of you that are listening to this. And I would encourage you to have an open mind and an open heart and really think about what possibilities are out there for you. Thanks for listening. For more information on this week's guest, visit the episode notes section on mindbizlife.com. And if you'd like to share your story with us, click on the Awaken Your Soul tab on mindbizlife.com and fill out the submission form. Don't forget to share this episode with a friend and be sure to give the podcast a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is that you tune in and turn it up. Join me on Wednesday for more Life Mastery Conversations, but until then, remember... Every level of life is an opportunity to grow. Be well, my friend.